All right. Thank you very much for uh, coming on time for uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, today, the topic of our lecture will be uh, minimum mean square estimation. Uh, we begin this lecture by uh, summarizing what we have discussed uh, so far. Suppose we have taken a sample of some random variable. Let's say uh, we have n samples. So this sample was taken at time t1, and this was taken at time t2, and this was taken at time Tn. <coughs> Suppose our interest is to reason about this sample at time t is equal to t1. Now, if this t1 is less than Tn, this means we are interested in the past. Right? This is the suppose this is where we are. So if we are in, uh, interested to reason about the time which is below Tn, this is of course the past. The assignment or the problem we are dealing with, as I told you, is smoothing. It's a smoothing problem. If we are interested at time Tn, so if T1 is equal to Tn, in estimation theory, this is called filtering. OK, the problem we are dealing with is filtering. If, on the other hand, T1 is greater than Tn, that means we are looking in the future. Uh, this one is the past, by the way. Uh, sorry, the present. And this one is the future. And the problem we are dealing with is prediction. So collectively, whether we are dealing with a problem having something to do with the past, with the present, or with the future, collectively it's called an estimation problem. Okay, So collectively, this problem is estimation. Today, the, the the minimum mean square estimation is mainly a problem dealing with the present. So it is called uh, a problem having to do with filtering. OK, remember this. In the beginning, we have discussed. I'm just summarizing them today for you to uh, remember where we are. So what is minimum mean square estimation? And what are we trying to solve with this, uh, with this approach? Suppose we are interested to estimate the temperature of this room. The temperature of this room varies like this. This is an assumption. I have told you time and again there is no device on Earth that helps you to measure the temperature of this room with 100% accuracy. There is no such thing as a device that can measure the temperature with 100% accuracy. I have said again, and I'll repeat it today, 
we approach reality through our endeavor to estimate it, but we will never be able to touch it. Even at the quantum level, our capacity to grasp reality is limited by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. As we move away from uh, quantum realm into the uh, macro realm, our uncertainty, of course, increases. So we always include error into our uh, estimation. So the minimum mean square estimation tries to minimize in, in a, a statistical sense the mean of the error. So that's the purpose of the minimum mean square estimation. So suppose for now we are in this brief window, let's just call it DT, in a very infinite small uh, window of time, we measure the temperature using a very uh, sensitive, a highly sensitive uh, temperature sensor. Let's call. Okay, suppose this is a sensor. It helps us m to measure the, the temperature of this room. And let's just assume that within this period of time, the temperature does not change appreciably. It, ch it doesn't change or changes only very slowly over time. Okay? And within that period of time, we take 1,000 samples. And another assumption with uh, uh, estimation theory is that this sensor or the, the samples taken by this sensor have something to do with the reality. It's not that the temperature is 20 and the temperature sensor measures minus 4 degrees centigrade. We assume that the samples taken with the help of this sensor in, to some extent reflect the reality. Okay, now let's just assume for now the 1,000 sample look like the following. I'm using R uh, for this uh, purpose. Every time we make samples, we get a different value. Okay? So this, the, the, the outcome of the sensor can be considered as a random variable. Okay, let's just call the outcome of this sensor S as a random variable having its own density function, its own distribution, its own mean, and its own uh, variance. So if we plot the density function of this, uh, this uh, outcome, it looks like the following. Okay, as you can see here, Because every time we take samples, we get different values. The random variable is best described by the, the density function, its density function. Now, what happened really between uh, other during this period when we took samples using this sensor? Where comes this variation from. One reason may be that the sensor itself is noisy. It introduced, one reason may be the temperature was constant, but the sensor introduces its own noise. So noise comes from the sensor. So for example, let me just show you the, the type of noise that the sensor might have introduced into the uh, temperature measurement. So 
So this is the one possibility. As you can see, the temperature, the, the expected value of the temperature is 20. So we can assume that the temperature during this time stayed at 20 degrees centigrade, didn't really change. But the sensor introduces, uh, introduced its own noise into this uh, constant temperature and the result we could have obtained this measurement. Or it could be the case that both the sensor, the sensor introduced its own noise, but at the same time the temperature might have changed it. So we have now two sources of uh, uncertainties. The uncertainty arising from the temperature potentially uh, changing during this period of time, and the uncertainty, the uncertainty arising from the, uh, from the sensor itself. So with minimum mean square estimation, we try to minimize our uncertainty about the temperature. So let's call this temperature for now x instead of uh, t. Let's just call this x. It's called a hidden variable, a variable that cannot be touched. Okay, it's called a hidden variable. So our aim is to find this, we model x as a random variable, and to, to try to approximate or estimate x with the best estimation of x. Okay, this we assume is this x hat is the best estimation of of x. So the purpose of the minimum mean square estimation is to minimize the error between these two. Okay, the error arising from our estimation is x minus x hat. Okay, I'm dropping now the time index for now, okay? So that means here we have x of t, and here we have x hat of t. Here we have x, or x hat of t plus 1, and here we have x of t plus 1, and so on. So for now, I'm just neglecting the time. Let's just assume that, statistically speaking, the temperature is stationary. It doesn't, it's a statistical properties don't change over time for now. So this is the, 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 the goal. The goal of minimum mean square estimation is to minimize the expected value of the square of the error. OK? So the square of this error is x minus x hat square. And the expected value of this error is So our goal with minimum mean square estimation is to uh, minimize this error. Now there are different approaches of searching for the optimum x hat. Today we will begin with the simplest approach and then generalize it la uh, later on. So let's just assume for now, remember, the, the outcomes of the sensor have resulted in, in this density function. I have told you last time that if the width of this density function is bigger, our uncertainty increases. And if the width is uh, 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 not big, then our confidence in the uh, sensor increases. So let's just for assume somehow x hat is a function, some constant function alpha of this s. Okay, s is the random variable, remember, or the, of the, the, the measurement obtained from the sensor. So suppose, you know, this alpha encodes our confidence in the 
values of the, the, the sensor. So for now, we just have one sensor, and this is how we wish to express the relationship between the real uh, temperature measurement and our estimation. So how can we determine the optimum alpha, or the alpha which minimizes the error? The, uh, the approach would be, of course, to substitute this into this one. So now we have the error square, or the expected value of the square of the error can be described as x minus, now instead of x hat, we are going to substitute this one, alpha s squared. So what we're going to do is we differentiate this value with respect to alpha and set the uh, result to 0. And then the value of alpha, which we determine uh, likewise, is going to be the, the alpha we're looking that minimizes our uncertainty in the estimation process. So, or maybe we can use this, uh, this blackboard. So this is what we have. The square of the error is equal to x minus alpha s squared. And if we differentiate this with respect to alpha and set this to 0, what we're going to have is, you know, using the chain rule, first we have 2 times x minus alpha s. And then the inner uh, differentiation results in minus s. And this has to be set to 0. Both the minus and the 2 we can forget because we can take them to the other side. And then we can now distribute. So what we get is the expected value of xs uh, minus alpha, the expected value of s squared is equal to 0. So rearranging terms would give us alpha is equal to E of xs divided by E of x squared. Now, this is a very important uh, outcome. But what are these terms related with? So the first one, this is related to the joint <coughs> density function of x and s. So what does this mean? This term helps us to determine how accurately s reflects x. This is a core relation between x and s. So this term tells us how well they are correlated. The better the correlation, the, uh, the, the larger the value of this term would be. If there is no correlation, of course, this tends to be 0. OK? Now, therefore, it has to be directly proportional to the confidence we assign to alpha. OK? If the correlation is good, we have to give better grade to alpha. And if the correlation is bad, we have to give bad grade to, to alpha. So there is a direct correlation between them. How about the denominator? The denominator is related to the variance. You know that the variance of s is expressed like this. If s is a 0 mean random variable, like we assumed, for example, here, you see, we assumed here s is a 0 mean, uh, normally distributed uh, random variable. So this term is going to be e of s squared. So this, the denominator, 
is nothing but the variance of the uh, the values of the sensor. So if the variance is big, that means our uncertainty increases. If the variance is small, then our uncertainty should be decreased. So as you can see here, a, a, a alpha has inversely prop, uh, inverse relationship with the, the variance and direct relationship with the covariance. Is everything fine so far? So this is when we have only a single sensor. OK? Now, how will the assignment of alpha changes if we have multiple sensors? Consider the following. So now, I will go to uh, two random variables, and then we can generalize uh, later on to n uh, random variables. Now we're going to observe the temperature of this room with two sensors, S1 and S2. And for now, let's just assume that they have different statistical properties. That means the outcomes of these sensors have their own density function, uh, mean, and Variance. Likewise, here we have okay, different different variants, and this is reflected. This we wish to reflect uh, in our uh, samples. So let so the outcome of the first sensor look like the following. And the second sensor we plot suppose we have these sensor readings. As you can see, uh, both of them seem to target uh, 20 degrees centigrade at the uh, most expected value, or the, the, uh, the expected value, but the variance of the two sensors are quite uh, different. This can be highlighted by plotting the density functions of these two sensors. So the first sensor has this, this density value. As you can see, the uh, uh, samples vary somewhere between uh, 17 to 20, 23. And uh, the other one had this distribution uh, slightly different. Okay? The, the values go uh, from, minor, uh, from 14 uh, to 26. So this one introduces more uncertainty into our uh, observation than, than this one. Now the, pos the, the idea of any combination mechanism, as I have told you many times, is to ensure that as a result of the combination of the two sensors, our confidence should be better than either of them. Okay? The aim should be to find a combination mechanism we, we, we take both of them as relevant evidence, we, and we combine them in such a way that, by doing so, our final uncertainty is less than the, the uncertainty arising either from S1 or from S2. Okay? Now let's assume that we can use a linear estimation mechanism using mean square estimation. And then I will show you how mean square estimation helps us to find a combination mechanism so that our uncertainty by the end of the day is uh, smaller than the com uh, either of them.
OK. So suppose we combine them linearly and then define the alphas in such a way that uh, other result of this combination, the error is going to be smaller. So as usual, x is the random variable we wish to estimate. OK, x is our uh, random variable of interest. And x hat is the best estimation of x. OK, and s1 and s2 are the observations we have. OK, or you can call them the statistics. In uh, linear mean square estimation, we can express x hat as a combination of alpha 1, s1 plus alpha 2, s2. OK, so our aim is to determine alpha 1 and alpha 2. And the error, remember, is described as x minus x hat. And this is equal to x minus, now instead of x hat, we have alpha 1 s1 plus alpha 2 s2. So this is our error. And the square of this error is x minus x hat square. And this is x minus alpha 1 s1 plus alpha 2 s2 square. And we're going to minimize the, uh, the expected value of the square of this error. So e square, the, the expected value of this is going to be x minus alpha 1 s1 plus alpha 2 square, OK? Now, the value of the alphas which minimize this error can be uh, determined uh, through the partial differentiation. So to determine alpha 1, what do we do? To determine alpha 1, we have to differentiate differentiate with respect to alpha 1 and set the value to 0. OK? So this means the partial with respect to alpha 1 of the expected value of the square of the error is going to be so the whole term, first we have to differentiate. And that results in 2 times x minus alpha 1 s1 plus alpha 2 s2. So this is for the, uh, the square. And then using the uh, chain rule, if we differentiate this one with respect to alpha 1, it's going to be 0, right? And if we differentiate this with respect to alpha 1, we get minus s1, right? So here we have minus s1. And this has to be set to 0. Once again, we can take 2 and minus to the other side so they don't bother us. So what we are left with is the expected value of, look, now this S1 multiplies with S2. S1 multiplies with S1. And S1 multiplies with x. 
So what we get here is uh, x s1 minus alpha 1 s1 squared, and then minus here uh, alpha 2 s1 s2. So this is what we have. And we have to set this to 0. So if we take the minus terms to the other side, what we have here is the expected value of x and s1. So this is the correlation between the values of the sensor 1 with the real measurement we're seeking, that is the, uh, the, the temperature, is equal to, now here we have alpha 1 e of s1. So this is the variance of s1 plus alpha 2. What we have is here e s1, s2. OK? So let's just call this one R01. R01 simply means 0 is the, the uh, random variable which we wish to estimate. And 1 relates to the correlation of this random variable with the first source of evidence, that sensor 1. And here we have alpha 1. Let's just call this, because this is a square, you see, s1, s1. So let's just call it r11. OK, we know that this is the, the, the uh, variance. But we can also understand this as the correlation of the sensor data with itself, plus alpha 2. So this is r12. That means. Because these are measurements, we have them already at hand. We can see how well correlated they are. How often have they seen one and the same event together? Or how diverse are they with respect to one and the same uh, event? OK, so this is the first question, the first uh, uh, term we derived with respect to alpha 1. So we can do now the same thing for, for alpha 2, because we have to uh, uh, determine the value of alpha 2 as well. For the value of alpha 2, now we will have r12, just following the same approach. Here we have alpha 1, r12, plus alpha 2, r22. In general, if we have now n evidence, this was just an illustration for you to comprehend the, the problem. In general, if we have n sources of evidence, what we are going to do is the following. Generally, if we have n, we have n equations and n unknown because the alphas are now going to be n. Okay. In general, if we have n sensors, now we are going to have. n alphas. So the equation is going to be r01, r02, r0n. What are this? The correlation of the, sense, uh, the, 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 the temperature with respect to sensor 1. Correlation of the same temperature with respect to sensor 2 correlation of the temperature with respect to the end sensor. OK, so for this one, we have alpha 1, R11, plus alpha 2, R12, 
plus alpha n r1 n. So what are these? The variance of the first sensor, the correlation of the first sensor with the second sensor, how, how similar are the outcomes of the first sensor and the second sensor, and how similar are the first sensor, the outcomes of the first sensor with respect to the ends sensor. Likewise, for this one, we have alpha 1 R21 plus alpha 2 R22 plus alpha uh, N R2N. OK, so the correlation between the first and the second sensor, you see some symmetry here. The correlation of the second, or the variance of the second sensor, correlation of the second sensor with respect to the end sensor. So here we have, for this one, alpha 1 R1N plus alpha 2 R, Rn1, which is the same as R1N, Rn2 plus alpha N Rnn. Now, the most important uh, thing to uh, do is what are their statistical relevance? What are they? Where do they come from? Once we have formulated like this, we can describe this in terms of uh, uh, metric. So let's just call this one. Here we have R01, R02, R0n. Here you see a square, uh, a square matrix with entries R11, R12, R1n, Rn1, Rnn. OK, so this is the metric. And then we have the alpha. Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 8. What's our goal? Our goal is to determine the optimum coefficients, right? The proper weight we assign to each sensor. And this can be described as alpha 1, alpha n. Because this has to go now to the other side, and it will be uh, inverted. So this is R11, R1n, R21, R2n, Rn1, Rnn, inverse times R01, R02, R0n. This is how we determine the different coefficients. I'm going to highlight what they mean, because this is very important. Where do we get this, this matrix? Can you tell me? Where, where do we get this matrix? Or how do we construct this matrix? Because we have already taken measurements, right? You see, we, we have taken measurements. These are the measurements. If we have these two measurements, we can determine the covariance of these two measurements, right? We can make the covariance. You remember how we define the covariance? The covariance of two random variables, x and y. is the expected value of x minus eta x times y minus eta y, right? 
So here we have, this is eta 20 degree. Here we have 20 degrees. So eta x and x, eta y are already given. For any value of x, we, for any sample of x, we can subtract it from the mean. For any value of y, we can subtract it from the mean, and then we multiply them. So this is something we have already. Okay. So let's just see the using r, the covariance of S1 and S2 is something we can calculate. You see here? As long as we have made measurements, as long as we have the samples, this metric we can construct easily. So this is something we have. For now, we have only two, two sensors. So the covariance is just between x and y. This ones also we have. The diagonal, uh, the diagonal elements of the metric. You see this one? What are they? Do we have them? Do we have them? Yes? These are the variance from the census, right? We have them, right? In fact, implicitly, they are encoded here. Implicitly, the variance is related to the width of this density function, right? So we have the variance. OK? So this one we have, this ones we have. So this matrix is easy to construct. Now the big question is, where do this come from? Where does this come from? Yes. Yes. You remember this I have already highlighted. This is, if we consider R01, the manufacturer, we can set the temperature, for example, at zero. And then use a highly sophisticated sensor to measure the temperature. So this is set to zero. And then we use our own sensor S1 and see how accurately it measures this fixed temperature. And then by doing so, we can determine R01. For the second sensor, we can do the same. OK, so this description usually comes from the manufacturer. So we have this one, so we have this one. So the alphas we can easily determine. Once we have the alphas, then it's possible to determine or to properly combine the different outcomes in order to approximate or estimate the temperature. Are we fine? So this is a linear approximation or a linear estimation using the minimum mean square estimation approach. Now the biggest question is, is linear estimation always the best estimation? The answer is no. We are, we've been already biased. We assume that we can linearly combine the sensors, uh, the, the outcomes of the sensors. Suppose they cannot be combined linearly. Suppose the relationship is otherwise. So is it possible to come up with an estimation strategy without any bias, without any assumption how the different sensor outcomes are related with one another? And this is what we're going to, to do.